Support for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere is made possible by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. Also, Sherlock Holmes and the Cryptic Clues, A Grave Undertaking, a fantastic new book by Michael McClure. And the Baker Street Journal the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Subscriptions available at bakerstreetjournal.com. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, Episode 123. Scott and Bert. I hear of Sherlock everywhere since you became astronomer. In a world where it's always 1895, comes I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. (laughs) The game's afoot as we discuss goings-on in the world of Sherlock Holmes enthusiasts, the Baker Street Irregulars, and popular culture related to the great detective. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Burke Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hello! Hello! That's like music to my ears. I don't know about you, but welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder, and I didn't know we were doing the three students in this show. (laughs) You didn't know that Mo, Larry, and Curly were the original three students? No, no. Yeah. I'm glad we're prepared. (laughs) Well, I'm just, I'm, I, I have to wonder which one of them it was that got sent down to Rhodesia. <laughs> or was that Shemp? Or was, oh, oh, that, no, I may have been, I may have been Curly Joe. Shemp, Shemp was actually the, uh, he, he was the butler. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't Soames, it was Shemp. Uh, little known facts here on Sherlock Holmes history. That's right. Well, we're not stooging around this time. We're here for another interview show, and this oh. one is going to be, well, a little different. Um, because, first of all, we'd like to share with you, dear listener, this news here first. With the advent of our other show, Trifles, we find ourselves delving into a number of canonical topics. And it's not as if we're ever going to run out of topics, but... It has become increasingly more difficult for the two of us to think about long-form shows in which we discuss a single topic. And we've had a number of them uh, in the past so that we alternated. Every other show was a discussion show, while the alternating show would be an interview show. And in conjunction with this, not dearth of content, but maybe the the preservation of these discussions for trifles, which, by the way, you can find on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com or on any major podcast listening service that you use. But we also found that there are an inordinate number of people with whom we wish to speak. There are all kinds of interesting authors and Sherlockians and entertainers and Folks who are toiling away in the world of Sherlock Holmes. And when they release a book or a new project, it seemingly has to be in time with our interview cadence or has had to be in time with our interview cadence. And we thought, you know, if we simply did an all interview format, it might actually lend itself toward more timely promotions and coordinations with what these fine interview subjects have going on. So, to kick that off, as if to use guinea pigs of a certain sort, we thought that we would thrust our collective necks out there and offer ourselves up as interview subjects. 
Are we going a little too far, Bert? Oh, no, no. I'm just really sorry I'm not available. But look, let me look at my calendar. (laughs) (laughs) And and do my – no, I don't think we're going too far. You know, I think we both were a little uh, hesitant to do this because, you know, folks have heard a lot about us and from us over the last 10 years. I mean, my goodness, we've been doing this for 10 years. Wow. But there are – you know, we have thousands and thousands of downloads every month and there are plenty of people who might not have come in at the beginning of the story. So I thought – so I think both of us agreed, uh, you know, although neither one of us is really happy about talking about themselves. I thought we would both give it a shot. Second thing I would say is that – don't. by the way, don't uh, read between the lines here and, in, and believe that there's any sort of ulterior motive here. We are not paid. By, by people who, to whom we interview. You know, if you've got a book like Michael Sims' book or any of the other folks that we've talked to or folks we've interviewed, nobody ponies up money for us to uh, chat about their work. Uh, we're very grateful for our sponsors, but those are clearly sponsors. So the folks that we reach out and talk to, we reach out to because we say, we feel that we're interested in them. And I know, you know, I particularly come across sometimes as very enthusiastic because my approach to all of this is, Really, as a as a hobbyist, as an enthusiast, rather rather than as a journalist, but we bring them because we think you're interested in uh, be as interested in as we are in um, hearing about them. So that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, and we we should say that we do receive review copies of the books uh, whose authors we do interview. That is the only form of compensation that they do provide us with, and. One would hope that they do so in order for us to have some sort of informed level of discussion. Those of you who have listened to such interviews may beg to differ. (laughs) Well, yeah, and as you can tell, you know, we really do read the books. The other reason why we're doing this, which we weren't really going to disclose, is that we had, you know, the other suggestions we had for this particular show, uh, I was really in favor of, but Scott, you know, he did not want to do a show about the tax code or health (laughs) care. <laughs> so there you are. Now it would have put you to sleep even faster than our regular shows, unfortunately. <laughs> um, well, it's a pre-existing condition, actually. <laughs> do not, do not go there. Uh, well, that that actually may feed into a a a, a further discussion point later in the show. So uh, we will get to the interview in just a moment. But before we do that, we thought it was important to acknowledge that while we do not receive compensation from uh, the folks that come on the show, and we do receive compensation from our sponsors, there is also another opportunity for folks to get involved, and that is if you would like to become a patron of the arts, shall we say. Oh. Um, you know, we, we heard a little bit of confusion between uh, some of our listeners who, who hear us talking about this thing called Patreon. Well, Patreon is very simple. It's that if we put out a new episode, you have a donation associated with that. So for each new episode, you as a patron would essentially be billed. Um, so if we don't create content, you don't pay anything. Uh, and you can choose the level of support that you would like on a per show basis. However, we also have the opportunity, if you would like to just make a donation outright, if you'd just like to make a one-time donation, that works as well. Uh, we've got a PayPal option on our site. So you can either go to our site and click on the uh, support on Patreon button, uh, or you can just hit the become a patron, uh, section of the menu. And we've got a whole page there that gives you these options. However, you would like to support us. We do appreciate whatever you can do. And we know a lot of folks have stepped up recently. And if we reach a certain level, we are going to publicly recognize all of these people, kind of like a, a wall of shame, if you will. <laughs> Uh, or a hall of fame, something like that, where we thank our donors. So thank you in advance for considering that and head on over to IHearOfSherlock.com to check it all out. Yes. And there are great reasons for you to support the show. One, of course, is that if you become a patron, you get to speak to us in a patronizing tone. And we love that, actually. So feel free to patronize us at any point. But also, many of you have lived lives or are living lives of accomplishment. 
uh, for which we, and achievement for which we salute. But now is a wonderful time to live also a bit in the standpoint of contribution and significance. And your support of the show would mean a great deal to us. And also there is, uh, another higher, um, mission solved here. Some weeks ago, we had a little spot where we talked about the value of your contribution for Dr. Watson. And we thought we would follow that up with this appeal. He was born in the north of England and never speaks about his father, mother, or childhood. He bruises corpses with a stick. He goes days without eating and shoots a pistol indoors. He keeps a wax bust of himself, which occasionally wears his clothing. He threw a mathematics professor off a cliff in Switzerland and ran from the scene. He sends poor children into the street to search for dangerous criminals. He faked his own death, possibly for the insurance money. He has burgled houses, destroyed private property, and let murderers go free. We need your help to make sure Sherlock keeps his place in society. Donate today at patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock. <laughs> uh, I like that better than my appeal. Much more appealing. Yeah, we need your help to make sure Sherlock keeps his place in society. Only you can help. Hit that Patreon button right now. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for considering that. And, you know, if you choose not to donate to us, that's completely fine. But we do have sponsors, and we hope that you will patronize our sponsors, that you will give them your business and mention that you heard about their sponsorship on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere when you shop from them. And one of the first fine individuals or institutions, I should say, that has joined us in that respect are our friends at Wessex Press. Here in the ancient Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Wessex, we are looking forward to July 15, St. Swithin's Day, when a day of rain means 40 more days of showers. But you won't be needing your wellies or Macintosh, because you'll be dry inside, reading your copy of Sherlock Holmes and the Newspapers, Volume 3, from our historic Wessex Press. The last six months of 1893 live again as you read about the supposed death of Sherlock Holmes and witness Conan Doyle's rise as a celebrated author, carefully edited by Matthias Bostrom and Matt Laffey. The sun, his golden face around, he bears to all the garden ground and sheds a warm and glittering look among the ivy's inmost nook. It's summer, the perfect time to reach for the pleasure only a volume from the Wes Express can provide. Choose yours today. I should say that, that while we are not compensated by uh, any of the folks we have to interview, the folks in the ancient ancestral kingdom of Wessex do send me a goat and a barrel of mead. <laughs> 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 well, you know, at least they're good for that. Uh, you know, they, 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 they put out fine publications and goat and mead. <laughs> they do. Actually, well, that's that, the, that's that, the, that, that, that yeah. could have been the subject of one of our trifles shows when we talked about <laughs> pubs and, and taverns. Uh, I'll see you down at the goat and mead. <laughs> the old goat and mead. <laughs> well, that's the wonderful thing about dealing with an agrarian economy. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, we're not here to talk about goats or mead or other things agrarian. We're here to talk about oh, our favorite topic, ourselves. Oh, I no, thought we were going to talk about yourself. Yourself. Well, you know, we thought we might pattern uh, this interview slightly on uh, the the oral history project that the Baker Street Irregulars uh, have undertaken. 
Now, every member of the Baker Street Irregulars has a chance to tell his or her story uh, to another Irregular who interviews that person. And there is a, a, a set of standard questions that get you to, to know that individual and their activities and whatnot. So uh, we thought we might try at least some of that here in order to give you a better sense as to who we are uh, rather than just the snarky, uh, witty individuals that you have come to know and put up with. You notice they didn't say love. And dislike, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, would you, would you like to, um, to ask the first question or would you like to be the target oh, of the first question, Bert? No, I would love to, um, ask the first question. So where were you, Scott, where were you born? Uh, I was born in a hospital. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. We, you must be my long lost brother. I too was born in a hospital. <laughs> no, I, uh, I grew up in uh, a little town in Connecticut called Suffield. It's uh, right on the border of Massachusetts and Connecticut, right by the Connecticut River. Uh, it was a small farm town of about 10,000 people or so. Uh, very bucolic, very classic New England. You know, that, that the town green with the white church and steeple uh, up on the hill there. Mm. Um, and it was a, was a lovely area. Uh, great, great education, great school system. Uh, it's where my father grew up. Uh, and it's, it's where I grew up and, and even followed his footsteps and, and my mom's footsteps, uh, before I was of working age, uh, they sent me to work on a tobacco farm. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. So boy, can, I mean, my, I used to be a, well, I had done my, my past includes some experiences with tobacco, but so I would have been Connecticut tobacco, which in those days was probably used as a wrapper for things like cigars. Uh, it still is. And actually, uh, the, the two summers that I worked, the first summer I worked broadleaf, which is out in the, in the sun. You're chopping the whole plant down and the plant gets turned upside down and speared on, on laths and hung up in the, barn to cure and what they do is they strip the leaves off of the plants after they've cured and those those whole leaves are the wrappers the second summer uh and and you're probably wondering what the heck does this have to do with sherlock holmes but it leads somewhere uh, 100, 140 varieties and all that you know um the second summer i worked shade tobacco where you go through and you pick off the individual leaves similar thing they go into the barn to cure but then the leaves get chopped up and are the filler in the cigar. It's amazing. You know, I've known you for such a long time. I had no idea. So, um, well, it was know, enough. To, it was enough to <laughs> cure me of the, the desire to do any kind of manual labor for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, but you know that, and the tobacco, of course, then is, is aged in barns and dries over a period of time, you know, before it can actually be used. And, um, Gee, in the old days, they used to, there used to be very popular Connecticut cigars. That's actually, right. Yeah. Made in First cigar so what, factory in, uh, the United States was actually in West Suffield, Connecticut. So how old were you when you were out in the tobacco? Fourteen. Fields? Wow. Fourteen, yeah. And what did your parents do? Well, uh, my father was a truck driver and, uh, my mother was, uh, kind of an office manager and, um, you know, an administrative genius. She was, she was a stay at home mother until I was about, uh, 12 or 13, I think. Then she went back to work, but she always worked with, uh, executives and, you know, ran a lot of things. My father was a, a card carrying member of the Teamsters. Oh, bless him. Yeah. Bless him. Was a long haul trucker? No, he was, he was, uh, local. So he was, uh, out in the morning, uh, back at, at night. I know. So he was part of my, uh, Part, part of the regular day. He coached baseball for me and, you know, lots of activities like that. Do you have, do you have brothers and sisters? I do not. I am, I am one and only, <laughs> which, which probably explains a lot. <laughs> well, see, that's, that's something else we have in common. I uh, always yeah. say to people, you know, I don't speak to my sister, but that's because I was an only child. <laughs> well, where, where were you born? I was born in Man, in New York, in Manhattan. My, um, but I grew up in Pennsylvania when I was, uh, a year or two old. No, wait a minute. That can't be. Well, when I was somewhere between one and three years old, my family moved to Pennsylvania. So I grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania, oh. which, which now has, I think, the distinction of being one of the top most, um, 
I'm trying to find the right word here, uh, challenged, financially challenged, depressed areas in the United States. Every time I see stories in the newspaper about communities in trouble, sadly, um, I see Reading mentioned. But when I grew up in Reading, it was a lovely, it was probably quite similar to your experience in Suffield, Connecticut. It was a lovely little rural existence. Uh, I still remember concerts in the band shell. I would walk to school. Mm. I, my childhood, you know, was surrounded by nothing you would think of if you were a child who grew up in Manhattan. It was surrounded by trees and uh, and in a in a rural community and things yeah. like the cuts the Cutstone State Fair and uh, years later, big outlet stores moved into Reading. Wow. But in the days that I grew up there, uh, it was a lovely little town, and I would walk from my house into the town and. Go to the library, huge, wonderful old library. Of course, you always it, had the, the wonderful PR uh, from being part of uh, the Monopoly board, too. You know, you... <laughs> right, the Reading Railroad. <laughs> yes, and the Reading Railroad obviously stopped right in town. And uh, my mother and I would go to New York on the railroad because her family and uh, mother and brother still lived in Manhattan. So we'd go in relatively frequently to visit or my father would drive us in and we would spend weekends in Manhattan during the year. So what was it that prompted your family to move from the city out to Pennsylvania in the first place? Was it your father's I, job? Yes. Yeah. My mother hated it, I must say. Uh, but my father was a chemist. He was a hmm. dye stuff expert. His expert, he was a chemist and colorist. My father knew more about fabrics and dye stuffs and how dye stuffs would react to fabric and how they would age and how color would fade. Oh, wow. Well, we and, should have had him on the show on trifles to talk about the dressing gowns. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was his expertise. And he got a job. He Sadly, he worked for years uh, at, uh, my, you know, my father had a very good long life and had a wonderful outlook. He's a very cheerful man. But sadly, my father worked uh, in his younger days uh, in Manhattan for companies, including the National Aniline Company. And the word aniline, you know, he, he spent a lot of time working with aniline dyes, which I think are coal tar derivatives. I think that's connected oh, to There's another homes connection and there, yeah. But the problem is they're highly carcinogenic. And so oh. he developed colon cancer in the early 1960s. And he was an amazing success story after – Surgery, he had, uh, you know, certainly 20 uh, healthy years. Wow. Um, or m more after that. But um, uh, so he was a textile chemist and colorist, and he got a job at a company in Reading called Berkshire Color. And the place, where, a company where he worked was quite near my elementary school. And I remember very proudly as a little kid, um, you know, you were encouraged to bring things into class and to talk about events. Uh, I invited, I, I was able to get my entire class to walk from our elementary school over to my father's company where he showed us the dye stuff lab and he showed us how to make paper. Among other things, he um, had the machinery there for uh, pressing fibers into paper and things like that and treating them with color and chemistry and so hmm. on. So I was very, a very proud little kid as my dad demonstrated all that to my class. Yeah, yeah. So at what point did you first encounter Mr. Sherlock Holmes and in what format was it? In Reading, in school. My memory is in the fifth grade. I was a compulsive reader like many of our listeners. And I had been going through the books in my school library and the books in the local library. But – my school, I'm pretty sure it was in my school library. There was a very thick, for me anyway, as a little, as a littler kid, uh, a thick, heavy compilation with lots of plates and illustrations. There were color plates, at least one color plate in the frontispiece, and, and I think the pageant illustrations. And that was uh, a book that I glommed onto. And I remember taking that to my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Ritchie. And because it was such a big book, I said, look, Mrs. Ritchie, heavy reading. I thought this was such a great joke. <laughs> so even then, I was easily entertained. <laughs> well done. And did it did it stick at that point? I mean, that, that was the first exposure, but uh, did, did it stay with you? Oh, yeah. I always loved Sherlock. Oh, absolutely. From the first time I read the stories. And then eventually, I would encounter the movies on television, which just uh, – 
even even then, you know, you, it was very difficult to sort of to avoid Sherlock. Sherlock was in uh, magazine advertisements. There were movies sometimes on television. There were, you know, various references on the radio. You'd hear about Sherlock Holmes. So, uh, yeah, I I was uh, completely captivated by Sherlock Holmes, by 1895, by England, by Inverness Capes. What age did you encounter Sherlock? Well, I I had an encounter probably around the fifth grade or so, but it it didn't really stick with me enough. There are two instances I can recall that are a little foggy in my mind. One is, I think I was in the fourth grade. I was over at my friend's house, and I saw this little, uh, you know, remember those almost little square books that are, um, they're called Illustrated Classic Editions. There was a, a picture on every page uh, facing the, the, the text. And these were um, uh, these were edited editions, not the full editions. But I, I remember uh, reading this one called uh, Sherlock Holmes and the Case of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Hmm. I remember that that uh, the terrifying hound being seen on the uh, on the page there. It's just one of those things that that stuck with me. Uh, but not enough to go and, and pick up the actual full uh, non-picture book edition of it at that point. And then uh, I think it would have been around fifth grade or so. We took a class field trip uh, to a theater uh, somewhere uh, south of us in Connecticut. And uh, I remember seeing the Crucifer of Blood. Hmm. Um, but again, not a true Sherlock Holmes story. You know, it was a kind of an amalgamation of a number of stories. Um, not enough again to get me hooked, but enough to, you know, at least appreciate a trip to the theater at the time. But it wasn't until, uh, boy, it would have been the summer when I was 15, I think, just before, well, 14 or 15, uh, just before entering, uh, I think my sophomore year of high school. Uh, where I picked, uh, I must have picked up your heavy reading, one of those big books of uh, Sherlock Holmes stories, and I, I opened it. The first story in it was A Study in Scarlet. And I took it to the beach uh, in Rhode Island uh, with us. And that was my beach reading. And I just remember being so out of sorts when I got to the break between the two sections of A Study in Scarlet and wondering, did some pages fall out? Did, am I reading another story now? It just made no sense. But I plowed through it, and I was hooked. And I read the rest of the book that week uh, at the beach, which included The Sign of Four. It included um, probably The Adventures and Memoirs, I would imagine. Hmm. And by the time we got back to school in the fall, the assignment was uh, pick an author and do a research paper. And we're going to teach you how to cite uh, sources, how, how to do the, uh, you know, the, the ML, MLA style of, uh, documentation. And so I chose Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And being that Suffield was a small town, we didn't have a lot of secondary resources. They only had the original story. So there wasn't much information on Conan Doyle, uh, nor was there quite a lot in the town library. So I went to the teacher to plead my case, thinking that I would get excused from the assignment. <laughs> And boy, was I misinformed. And it was also a sense of timing, too, because Mrs. Roy said, well, you know, I just saw this program on uh, Evening Magazine the other night about this gentleman right here in Connecticut that has his own Sherlock Holmes Society. Why don't you call up Channel 3, get his phone number, interview him over the phone, and document him as a primary source? Well, that's interesting. So I called Channel 3, and they gave me the number, which you, that, that would be unheard of today. <laughs> um, because, of course, I'd go to Facebook and look him up. Um, and I, I called Harold E. Niver, and he answered the phone, <laughs> Baskerville Hall. And, and I heard the hounds baying in the background, and I thought, well, this, this must be the place. <laughs> and uh, Tyke, as he later became known to me, uh, spent an hour on the phone with me just – telling me all about the history of the character and, uh, you know, the stories and Conan Doyle's dealings with him and, and the eventual uh, weaving into popular culture. And at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, I, 
I run this group, and twice a year we have this meeting at Gillette Castle. Why don't you come on down and check us out and see what you think? And when the spring rolled around, I had my dad drive me down. <laughs> I was still, I was only 15 at the time. And, uh, you know, walked into this room of oh, 60 or so people in the Great Hall in Gillette Castle. And it was, you know, as we say, everyone from postmen to presidents and, and everyone in between, all there for the same reason. And it was just a warm and welcoming place. And I just, I felt like I really found my home. No, it's a lovely story. Yeah. And what a great way to get introduced, you know, from Tyke. There are, uh, there are a number of particular BSI, but you know, uh, there, there are Sherlockian luminaries all over the country that are not necessarily Ash or, or BSI who just have this way with people. They, they have a way of sharing their passion. They have a way of mentoring and encouraging younger people. And, and not being judgmental, uh, about it. You know, I mean, for all Tyke knew, I could have been, uh, an aficionado of Basil Rathbone films or the Jeremy Brett series or, you know, I, I just saw a young Sherlock Holmes on, in, in the theater or whatever. It didn't matter to him. It was that I was interested enough to, to, to seek out more knowledge and be curious. Speaking from a Sherlockian perspective, do you have any points of connection? with Mindy and with your kids? Do you think that any of your children will uh, echo those interests? No. (laughs) (laughs) No, they put up with me. (laughs) Pretty much it. (laughs) Uh, Well, how about you? You have uh, have three children, right? I do. Uh, My children are all uh, older than yours. Uh, but my eldest, uh, child, my, my oldest daughter, Jen, is, uh, very inter- is, has, has, has a big affinity for Sherlock Holmes and has been coming over the years to the meetings of the Cornish Hars up in Rhode Island oh. and has produced programs and things and is an invested member of the Cornish Hars. So, um, yeah, we have that commonality. I think it skipped my, um, uh, uh, other two kids and <laughs> my, my wife, Kathy, um, yes. tolerates my interest in uh, Sherlock Holmes, accepts, uh, acknowledges, acknowledges is a better word. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> we have our, we have our challenges from time to time. I mean, you know, if, if, if you left it up to us, we would do this almost full time. Um, and our spouses like to have a life too. So we got to respect that. Now, um, well, well, she has, my my wife is a skier and that's something that I have no interest in. And so she goes off on ski trips and I go to the BSI dinner. So it all works out. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. So, um, I don't, I don't want to get too BSI heavy here because we we don't want to bore people with the background of the BSI and everything, but just quickly, uh, if you could uh, talk about what what the how you first became aware of the BSI and and what your impressions of it were initially, I was charmed. I mean, the simple answer, the accelerated simple answer here is that when the Baring Gould annotated came out, I acquired a copy of it, and this came out for those folks who don't know, circa nineteen sixty six, nineteen sixty seven, and it included, in addition to all of the annotations about the stories, explaining what a basket chair was, what a handsome cab was, what a four-wheeler was, what the pink gun was, you know, all the references that made sense in the Sherlock Holmes stories in the 1890s in England but might not make sense in the 1960s and 70s in America. In addition to those important annotations, there were essays by Bill Baring Gould on a variety of things. And one of the essays he had in this two-volume edition was about the Baker Street Irregulars. And I was stunned and pleased to read that and find out that there were other people who also loved this as much as I did. So I wrote in his essay, he mentioned Julian Wolf, a doctor in Manhattan. And I think I found Julian in the phone book and wrote him a note. And as Julian replied to everything, <laughs> uh, God bless him, and sent me, sent me back a note and connected me with Steve Clarkson, who in those days had a role mentoring younger Sherlockians. 
And Steve connected me to other people in my area, uh, Andy Page, who lived – by this time, I'd moved back to New York. I was going to high school in, in the Bronx and connected me to Andy Page, who also who lived in Riverdale, I think. And Andy and I became fast friends, and we – worked on the Priory School. In those days, we hmm. we had a scion. I think he'd formed it by the time I had came on the scene. And Andy and I and a couple of other guys that I really don't remember, except Andy Peck. Andy Peck was also part of that. Um, had a little scion going. My memory of which is is very limited. The only thing I remember is Andy's father i think was working in the school district or may have may have been a superintendent of schools or something some official and so andy had access to an office with a mimeograph machine and andy could type i could type too and we would type up the stencils for the newsletter and he would take them off or get them taken off to his father's office or his mother's office or something like that and they would be run off so we had a mimeographed newsletter and i remember we would put this huge accordion apparatus this this uh i don't know 15 foot uh accordion shaped aluminum thing we'd put out on a, on a table in his in his house and put in all the pages and then we'd walk around the table assembling and stapling the <laughs> the uh newsletter so that's how i first Amazing. found the baker street irregulars and Eventually, through Steve Clarkson's good offices, after it seemed like I was really serious and not too goofy, uh, got invited to um, a dinner at the Baker Street Irregulars. And I think at that point, or maybe at my first dinner, Andy was actually invested as Lord Saltier. Oh, wow. In, uh, in the Baker Street Irregulars. He was, uh, you know, about, he may have been a year older than I was, but he, we were roughly the same age. Okay. That is fantastic. And then for ever since then, until I was invested in 1988, I would get an annual invitation to the dinner, and I would go to the dinner whenever I could and had a grand time. Well, and, and you? As long as we're talking about the BSI, seems like a perfect time to talk about the Baker Street Journal and things going on with the Baker Street Irregulars Press right now. On BakerStreetJournal.com, you can find much more than just how to easily subscribe to the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship. For the month of July, listeners of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere will have an opportunity to get 50% off four titles. A Remarkable Mixture, To Keep the Memory Green, The Grand Game Volume 2, and The Remarkable Characters of Arthur Conan Doyle. Every one of these titles is representative of the kind of scholarship that you'll find in the Baker Street Journal and any BSI publication. And one of them is worth adding to your collection if you don't already have them. But with half off the list price, you really have no excuse to add one or more to your library. The sale runs from July 1st through July 31st or until stock runs out, whichever comes first. Website and PayPal orders only, please. So buy one for yourself and another, maybe as a birthday or holiday gift for your favorite Sherlockian. But act fast as the sale ends after July 31st. Go to, all lowercase now, ihose.co slash BSI July 50. That's ihose.co slash BSI July 50. Half price means that you'll thank us twice as much. What was your um, connection to the Baker Street Irregular? Well, it was one of those things where I really wasn't all that aware of it. I knew Tyke had these letters BSI after his name. I knew it was a parent organization, but I also knew that it was invitation only. So uh, I, I wasn't uh, going to be one of those precocious young people who wrote and asked for an invitation, which, you know, plenty of folks have done over the years simply out of Ignorance, because the BSI does not really make itself known that publicly. I thought, well, if they want me, they'll ask me. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile. So you're still waiting. Huh? Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> it happens a lot, I find. <laughs> I, I wait around an awful lot. Um, so when I, when I left Connecticut to go to school in Boston, uh, I, I thought, well, 
why don't I look up the the local Sherlockian society up here? And and I did so uh, after I think it was after my sophomore year because I was content with just commuting back to uh, home in Connecticut and going to Men on the Tour meetings while I was home on break. Um, but I think uh, I'm trying to think if it was the annot if if I got a copy of the annotated or if it was. Uh, if it was P.J. Doyle's uh, Baker Street Dozen uh, that clued me into some of the, the societies. But either way, I wrote to the Speckled Band of Boston uh, in, must have been May of 1990, just after they, it was a week after they had their 50th anniversary dinner. And as you know from us talking about the Speckled Band, uh, which, by the way, if you want to check that show out, that's ihose.co slash ihose77. It's episode 77. Um, they only meet once a year. <laughs> so I had to wait another 51 weeks if I wanted to go to the Speckled <laughs> Band. And I thought, well, there's got to be something else going on here. So I found the Friends of Irene Adler over in Cambridge that met at the opposite end of the calendar year. Uh, I discovered the Cornish Horrors. Uh, and I discovered... um uh, David Hool and, um, Watson's, uh, uh yeah, who is Tim? it? Uh, Jim, oh, no, Cox and Jim Duvall and David Hool. Yeah. Cox and company up in New Hampshire. And, um, I, I became a joiner. And then when I was so dissatisfied waiting for other people to have their events, I started my own group at, at Boston university called the bull terrier club. Uh, of oh. course, Holmes had been bitten uh, on the ankle by a bull terrier when he was, uh, at school and Boston University's mascot was the Boston Terrier. So I thought, well, why not, uh, why not combine it? So, uh, formed my own group. And then, uh, by the time I was in grad school, uh, I got a, a, a note from Tom Sticks to come to the BSI weekend. And, and so I did. And that was in 1995, I think. Huh. So, and again, it was just one of those things. You go to, go to the event and it's more than just the dinner. You know, it's the whole weekend and it's being around fun and like-minded people. For me, um, the best part of the BSI weekend for many, many years, for as long as I lived in Boston was simply the ride from Boston to New York because <laughs> Tom Francis would always pick me up in his car and and uh, in in uh, a couple years in, we added Richard Olkin to the mix, and the three of us would just have a raucous time driving down, talking about everything from uh, obviously Sherlock Holmes to jazz to The Simpsons to uh, you know world trivia. I mean, you name it. But we always just had a blast together, and to me, that was just a a microcosm of the larger world of being part of uh, uh, other Sherlockians, just enjoying each other's company. Well, that must have, uh, that earlier time must have been around the time that we met, because I remember you from those earlier meetings with the Cornish Hars. I had, I met Al Silverstein at, at my first, one of the habits in those days at the BSI dinner after the dinner was to gather in those days in the lobby of the Algonquin hotel mm. for drinks until the early hours. And I met Al Silverstein either in my first or second dinner. And Al was the, one of the leaders with Jan Prager of the Cornish Hours, And Al invited me up, um, for, um, a weekend, uh, you know, at some point just for a little bit of a holiday. I'd never been mm. to Rhode Island. And my girlfriend at the time, I was living with, a um, a lovely gal who uh, was also she also was a, a Sherlockian. And why'd you let her go? <laughs> <laughs> and she um that was an early connection point for us. Yeah. That interest in Sherlock Holmes. And in fact, uh I'd I'd met a couple of Sherlockians through her. And so we went up to uh Rhode Island in those days and became connected with the Cornish Arts. And I remember you from the those meetings in the late 80s, including probably one or two at the Alton Jones campus, because in those days we would have two meetings. Yes, yes. 
And then I, I moved to Europe in 1990, so I was sort of out of things for five years. And um, and I missed you so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew there was somebody. Well, yeah. you, do you know, uh, you mentioned Al Silverstein. And um, do you recall we, we were at one of your uh, Lunch of Steel events just a couple of years ago, and Peter Blau, speaking of the, the time in the Algonquin lobby, <laughs> <laughs> told told an Al Silverstein story that was so funny. Uh, I I think I might have it right here. Oh, buddy, Mary. This goes in the three hours for lunch club file. It isn't a three hour story, is it? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Five hour story. <laughs> the three hours. Al Silverstein has just arrived. Bravo. Well, that's a good that's a good three hour paper. That's a good story. That's a good story. And many many years ago, Al and I were seated across the table from each other at the end of that U shaped table that Kavanaugh is far below the salt. And that was the year that Al had laryngitis. Thirteen years old. Oh, they call the year of the blessing. And the crowd <laughs> applauded. <laughs> and and this is so long ago that we were able to communicate with each other. Notes passed across the table. I you mean, you didn't dancing text? men. Dancing <laughs> men. <laughs> well, the dinner was over, and I hope you still have those for the archive. No, no, no. The, wait, the waiter. Oh, I'm here. Yeah. 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 Know anything else? No. So, we're going to do it with the coat, a tent, uh, but it took. We returned to the Algonquin, some of us, well, actually more than some of us, because it started, there would just be two or three of us who'd come back to the Algonquin Act, John Bennett Shaw and John Crowley and I, and wait for the ladies to come back from the theater or something like that. But it, as with every Sherlockian event, more and more people came. And that year, there were about a dozen people sitting at a long table in the lobby of the Algonquin. And the waiter came around with a bill for the round of drinks, which I signed. And, and Al leaned across the table and, and whispered that, that loudly, ha ha, I told them to bring you the pill. <laughs> and I leaned across the table and said, <laughs> I see where this is going. Ha ha, I signed your name. <laughs> Oh, uh, good old Peter. <laughs> ha, ha. Ah, and poor Kavanaugh's is no more, and now we know why. <laughs> uh, yeah, but Al, what a, what a great Sherlockian, uh, compatriot, uh, mentor, uh, colleague to have. Yes. Wow. Yes. And he connected me to the Speckled Band and so many other organizations. Yeah. So, so when you're part of these groups and, and you have to give a toast or a, a paper, uh, are there any particular topics that you have traditionally gravitated towards? Are there any areas of specialty that my people go, ah, yeah, that's Bert, Bert's up. Now we know we can expect X. <laughs> well, I think two things, you know, I'm, uh, I tend to, um, it's, you know, it's a bit hard to describe. I tend to, prefer there there were a number of characteristics of Christopher Morley but one that was observed by almost any everyone who knew him especially his brother observed that he was a great sentimentalist and i uh, tend to gravitate towards toasts the conclusions of which are around um friendship and sentiment and and what the community hmm. and being together means and so that, that that's generally a characteristic of virtually all the toasts i wind up writing but a number of years ago i i sort of fell into uh, some years ago i was asked to give a toast at the sons of the copper beaches for violet hunter yes and it occurred to me that i'm a big fan of 
Well, ever since I've been a little kid, and I suppose it's one of the reasons why I have a deep interest in things Sherlockian, I've always been a fan of, of things that were gone long before I was born. I was a big fan of uh, <laughs> 1930s radio, like you, of the great radio comics, the literature of Victorian England. And uh, I've always been a great fan of old songs, particularly old music hall songs and things like that. So I took a song called The Girl in – uh, the, a gild, there's a wonderful song called The Girl in a Gilded Cage. She's only a girl in a gilded cage. A beautiful sight to see. And, uh, I just, I rewrote that, that lyric to apply to Violet Hunter. She's only a girl who is quite naive. And so as a result, at many of the meetings of the Sons of Copper Beaches uh, that have followed, I've been giving a singing toast to Violet Hunter. That's that. That's only not only uh, extremely creative, but that's got to be nerve wracking <laughs> meeting after meeting to know you're on point for that. Oh, no, it's enormous fun. They're, they're only meet twice a year after all. And it's not a I mean, I'm not this isn't, <laughs> you know, this isn't a refrain and a bridge. I mean, this <laughs> this is this is, you know, best toasts are a minute and a half. So I can usually come up with something and uh my old the good news is I, I'm such a fan of musicals, Broadway musicals, that I have a uh, storehouse of songs in my head, you know, that hmm. are, can easily be applied to Violet Hunter. So my last one was from Man of La Mancha to to the it was a lyric for Dulcinea, but instead of Dulcinea, obviously you'd be singing Violet Hunter, and. Um, in the past, I've used songs from Take Me Along. Take Me Along was a great comic musical with Eileen Hurley and Jackie Gleason mm. in the 1950s um, and many others. Camelot, I think I did one from Camelot some years ago. It's only a muddle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Yeah, lots of fun. Yeah. Well, we'll look forward to the next one. Yeah. I once did a toast at the BSI dinner for Mrs. Hudson, which I did to the tune of Mona Lisa, but that really wasn't. Oh, I good. remember that one. Yeah, it wasn't very Yeah. Good. You know, uh, my, uh, and I, I wish I could find the, um, the audio recording for this. I think they, they probably have it in the archives, but, um, it was my first toast. Uh, for the BSI. And I think, boy, it goes all the way back to, hmm, 2003, maybe? 2002, 2003? Mm -hmm. Uh, it was shortly after I was, uh, given an investiture. And I got a call from, I think it was Al Silverstein. He said, we'd like you to do a toast at the BSI dinner. Okay, great. Happy to be part of the lineup. Which one? Oh, to Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> okay, right out of the gate. No kidding. And, uh, you know, I just I thought, well, how am I going to make this uh, different? How am I going to make this uh, special? And like you, I had always looked to musical numbers for inspiration. Uh, I, I have had a lifelong uh, uh not aspiration to be, but at least an admiration for Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, if I could, if I could rewrite the lyrics in some way to be meaningful or funny or something, I, I would do that. But, but, but what's the song? What song am I going to dedicate to uh, Sherlock Holmes? And it turned out that uh, I was a, um, a big fan of Frank Sinatra at the time. And there was a song that he did, uh, from a short film in 1942 called The House I Live In. Uh, and the song, uh, started out what is it with, with, uh, what is America to me? Uh, words were by Lewis Allen, music by Earl Robinson. So I did, uh, what is Sherlock Holmes to me? Oh, I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's a great test. And it, I, I had fun with it because it allowed me to explore all the things that Sherlock Holmes means to us as a collective group. But when it really comes down to it, just like the 
just like the song that Sinatra sang, what is America to me? It's especially the people. You know, and that's, that's the way the toast ended up. So I had, I had the music playing in the background and I, you know, voiced the lyrics over to that. And I think I got a standing ovation as a result. Yeah. Well, I'm pretty sure you did. That's a great toast. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. But then at Autumn and Baker Street in 1998, I took my professional uh, interest, which was in managed care and combined it with the canon. So I took all the knowledge I had accumulated about the, the medical profession and managed care at the time, and I came up with a a paper called John H. Watson, M.D., Your Primary Care Physician. <laughs> <laughs> and recently I got a copy of the video. They, they had they had videotaped it and transferred from VHS to DVD and, and sent me that, and I watched uh, portions of it. And... Uh, I have the paper in front of me. I've had an electronic copy of the paper and it just doesn't have the same impact as watching the presentation. <laughs> uh, you know, I remember I got John Besh to come up and uh, help me do a Q and a uh, and you know, and, and I had to make a presentation to Bob Tomlin at some point throughout the, uh, the, the paper. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and that's, that's the thing I remember from all of these instances is, uh, being able to, again, find my niche, my people, right? And just enjoy these things together. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Well, and that's what the best of these things are. I mean, you look at them on the page. Um, you know, they're sort of instructions for creating something memorable, but they're not necessarily memorable on the page. And when they're done live, that's where that's the right. magic. And the heart comes from. What about what about your other interests? You are uh, of the two of us. You are much more of a collector than I am. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Maybe I'm more of an accumulator than you are. Um, well, I, I collect matchbooks. Um, I, I I don't collect, but I do have an affinity for uh, fountain pens. I know we have that in common. Um. Well, that's true. I mean, I never thought of myself as a fountain pen collector, but my uh, early on in our relationship, my wife pointed, asked me how many fountain pens and I had that I had, and I said, at the time, I, I said, uh, offered her a very large number, and she said, "Well, you're a collector." And I said, "No, no, I'm not a collector because I use <laughs> virtually all the fountain pens." And she said, "Anybody with that number of fountain pens is a collector." Well, it's almost like uh, you remember Senator Phil Graham from Texas. Mm. He uh, he collected guns. And somebody once asked him, Senator Graham, how many guns do you own? And he said, uh, more guns than I need, but fewer guns than I want. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how a true collector <laughs> responds. <laughs> oh, but, uh, but yeah, oh, well, you know what? I do. I collect one thing. Uh, I collect speckled band quiz bowls. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You also collect the uh, Edgar Smith, you know, Edgar Smith. Oh, well, stuff. yeah. In terms of my Sherlockian collection, yeah, it's a small but select library, as one would say, from the Gloria Scott. Um, but I realize there's no way I can just keep collecting everything. So I've tried to hone my my collection to the earlier, like pre 1960 um, original scholarship. Uh, in original publications. So Edgar Smith's publications, J. Finley Christ, um, H. W. Bell, uh, Vincent Sterrett, you know, some of those early editions that were by, uh, major Sherlockians that were firsts of their kind before we, uh, got into more, you know, I, I, I guess more, um, commercial publications. Hmm. So yeah. But that's it, really. I mean, I, you know, limited space, limited funds, limited time. You know, mm. I just, uh, I collect links online now. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> well, when I was much younger, I was a coin collector. My, uh, my father's mother had, um, I remember being as a young boy, being with my father when we visited his mother after his father had passed away. My grandfather had passed away. And my father was talking to his mom about her ability, you know, to sort of get by and what her day was like and 
how she managed to get her groceries. And my grandmother said, uh, you know, that there was a supermarket and if she didn't feel like going out, she would call them up and the boy would bring by her groceries. And then my grandmother said, I always gave him a medal. And my father said, what do you mean, mom, you, you <laughs> give him a medal? Well, my, my grandmother had this box of old coins and every time she got a delivery, she'd dip into the box of old coins and give him something. Well, we looked at the box of old coins, and the first thing we found was a half dollar or a silver – no, half dollar, I think, from the Centennial Exposition of 1900. It had been somebody's oh. coin collection. Oh, God. It had it – had, you know, American pennies from the 1700s. It has a whole box of old oh. coins. And so we took that away. <laughs> <laughs> no more for you. Coin yeah, and then I became a coin collector. And then I eventually I lost interest in coins and my father picked up my interest in coin collecting. So he was a stamp collector and coin collector. Yeah. Then, but, uh, That's wonderful. The oldest coin in that box, I, I once had it dated, was a silver denarius from the reign of Sextus Pompey. Really? Yes. So it had been, I still remember that. So it had been somebody's serious coin collection lost in the, in the mists of history at some point. Wow. My grandmother was giving it out to the delivery boy. Somebody took all the trouble to fish that out of an ancient parking meter and she, <laughs> she just gave it away. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny though. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hope this was, uh, enlightening and, and, and fun for folks. A little, little different, you know, the little peek behind the covers as to what makes us tick. We're always busy talking about, uh, the canon or, uh, news topics or asking questions of our interview subjects. So this was just a little something, uh, a little different, a little recherche, yeah. as it were. Well, one of the other recherche things that we have at our disposal is a new book called Sherlock Holmes and the Cryptic Clues, a grave undertaking by Michael W. McClure. Uh, Michael is a member of the Baker Street Irregulars, and he is also uh, a very in a very unique position uh, where he leads a group of Sherlockians that also are in the death business. <laughs> Uh, Stins, was it Stinson and Company? Um, these folks, uh, have gallows humor and, uh, pretty much have a pun for everything. And, uh, Michael was, uh, very generous in, uh, in, not only in terms of, uh, giving us a review copy, but, uh, mentioning us in the book. And there are a number of Sherlockians who are mentioned here. Uh, you know, Roger Johnson, who is also mentioned in it, calls it a deucedly odd but undeniably amusing tome. Uh, basically, you've got the final resting places of over 300 creations that uh, Conan Doyle uh, brought to life in the stories. And each, each canonical cemetery represents a, a different adventure of, um, of, of Sherlock Holmes. So, uh, for example, if I were to open to... Oh, let's see, page uh, uh, 147. It looks like we've got folks from the Norwood Builder here. Uh, we've got Jonas Oldacre. When Jonas studied roofing, he was preparing for the hereafter. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mrs. McFarlane. She loved housebroken cats, literally. <laughs> Dr. Werner, when Dr. Watson lost his patience, Dr. Werner gained his patience. Well, that's, that's a, a visual, uh, play on words there. Uh, when Watson lost his patience with T-I-E-N-C-E. Dr. Werner gained his patience, T-I-E-N-T-S. R-R. Yeah. John Hector McFarland, God works wonders and is proof he can. Here lies a lawyer and an honest man. 
So, so you've got that, that, uh, the, the sketch of all those tombstones with those, uh, epitaphs. And then you turn the page and it, uh, tells you exactly who they were. Mr. Cornelius was a fictional personage invented by Old Acre. John Hector McFarlane was the solicitor seeking Holmes's help. Mrs. McFarlane was his mother. Dr. Werner was the younger physician that purchased Watson's practice. And, and then it goes on to tell you who the investitures of BSIs were who, uh, well, not necessarily who were related. No, yeah, who were related to that story. So, uh, people that were invested as the Norwood Builder or as the papers of ex-president Murillo, uh, and on and on. So it's a, it's a really, uh, unique and interesting collection of, uh, canonical and societal and, uh, well, I'll go out on a limb, uh, humorous, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, works here uh, in in a very very inventive style by Michael McClure. Uh, you can find out more if you go to BaskervilleProductions.com. Click on the books link there, uh, or simply go to BaskervilleProductions.com/books and uh, read all about Sherlock Holmes and the Cryptic Clues, available in hardcover and paperback. You will not be bored by this. You will not. Die of boredom. <laughs> well, now, uh, I think that does it for that sponsor, but we do have one other unexpected one dropping by here, don't we? Friends, you don't have time for pesky cookbooks and trips to the grocery. That's why you need Mycroft's Kitchen from Sherlock Holmes Brand Products, a new subscription service that makes cooking fun and easy. With all the ingredients you need to make delicious meals in exactly the right proportions, the Victorian fine dining way. Dinner begins with raw oysters, a choice of two soups, an hors d'oeuvre, and a fish course, followed by saddle of lamb and fillet of beef, then chicken wings with green peas and lamb chops with beans and mushroom-stuffed artichokes. Sorbet will cleanse your palate before the roast quail, and don't forget the whipped creams, banana mousse, coffee, and liqueur with fruit and petty fours. It's the only home food subscription service that delivers the three C's. Consummate, capacity, comestibles. Comestibles. You will rarely waddle away from your home once you subscribe to Mycroft's Kitchen. Sign up at your local Sherlock Holmes brand retailer today. You know, I never get tired of uh, our friends at the Sherlock Holmes brand. They're always so creative, always inventive, always. Inventive. I'm gonna. They're they're working on an IPO. You know, I hope to buy <laughs> some. Sh- <laughs> I'd like to work on an IPA. <laughs> you know, you. It's, it's a summer. It's hot. It's good. Well, you know, while we are waiting for the Sherlock Holmes IPA to show up, um, <laughs> what a what a great time to delve back into unnecessary pastiche censorship. Welcome to unnecessary pastiche censorship, where we pull a book off of our shelves, read a random excerpt, and add the censor bleep. Like Sir Hugo Baskerville, it could be profane, it could be godless, but it's certainly funny. So join in and prepare to laugh your off as we play Unnecessary Pastiche Censorship. Well, it's been a few episodes since we've treated you to the dulcet tones and the censor beeps of Unnecessary Pastiche Censorship, but we're back at it. And in this case, we are delving into the big book of Sherlock Holmes stories, which is edited by our friend Otto Penzler. You can hear us talk with him about that on episode 87. That's ihose.co slash ihose87. Um, but in the meantime, why don't we pick out a, well, let's keep it anonymous. If folks want to figure out which story it was, they can, they can do that. But we'll pick it up about a paragraph into this story. Ah, good morning, Goswell, he said cheerily. But why do you press your under the bed? It was true, quite true. This extraordinary observer, the terror of every cowering criminal, the greatest thinker that the world has ever known, had ruthlessly laid bare the secret of my life. Ah, it was true. But, but how did you know? I asked in a stupor of amazement. 
He smiled at my d***. I have made a special study of d***, he answered, and of beds. I am rarely deceived. But setting that knowledge for the moment on one side, have you forgotten the few days I spent with you three months ago? I saw you d***. Then, he could never cease to astound me, this lynx-eyed sleuth of crime. I could never master the marvelous simplicity of his methods. I could only wonder and admire, a privilege for which I can never sufficiently be grateful. I seated myself on the floor, and embracing his <laughs> with both my arms, in an ecstasy of passionate adoration, gazed up inquiringly into his intellectual countenance. Those people ought to be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> or should we for reading it? Or should you for reading it? I've just uh, been Yeah, you had to listen to it. Oh, <laughs> your delicate ears. I'm sorry. Well, I suppose that does it for this episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Please, if you haven't already, go to the podcast source of your liking and leave us a rating or review. Tell people what you think of us and uh, how they might uh, think of us as well. Uh, leave us a comment at any of the places that you would like to. Uh, we are I Hear of Sherlock all over the web, including I Hear of Sherlock.com. Uh, show notes are available here at ihose.co slash ihose123. And in the meantime, I remain Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Wolder. <laughs> the, the game's, game's afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.